Good morning. So glad you could be with me today in our Unfolding the Word study. We're in the midst of 2 Peter in the third chapter. Today I want to pick up our reading in verse 10, even though we've studied that verse, because it's the bridge into what we want to look at today, which is verses 11 and 12. So listen to me as I read through 2 Peter. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Now, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. We've been talking about the issue of the day of the Lord, the end times, the broad topic over the whole third chapter of Second Peter. We've been discovering it in the most recent verses, certainly in verse 10 and beyond, that the time of God's final judgment on the earth, this day of the Lord, will come. And he will be followed with the creation of a new heavens and a new earth. The current world in which we find ourselves will be judged and destroyed. The heavens, the atmosphere will be dis disappear with a roar. The planet and the earth will be destroyed by fire. The elements that make it up and all of the works of humanity will be laid bare and exposed. And accountability will be inescapable for all of humanity. All of those things are things we've been looking at. Now, <clears throat> the promise of it all is that God will intervene in history. He is the Lord of history, and he will culminate history. Now today, really the beginning in verse 11, uh, the question before us is, well then, what ought we to do in light of that? What, how shall we then live? <laughs> is the way the old King James put it. How shall we then live? Well, let's talk about it, because God gives us some very specific directions here in answer to that, to that very practical question. The first of these is, accept that God means what he says. In other words, what God says about history, what he says about accountability, what he says about creation, destruction, and the new creation of a new heavens and a new earth, he means what he says since all of these things will happen. Notice that word, since all of this will happen. Not if all of this happens, you know, in the eventuality that this is the way it works out. Since this will be the way it works out. Not if this will be the way it works out. The intervention that God is talking about, the judgment that he's talking about, the culmination that he's talking about will happen. There's no maybe, there's no perhaps, it's definite. It will happen. And brothers and sisters, personal accountability for each and every one of us will take place unless we have passed out of judgment into life because we have turned to the one who is the answer to accountability, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. And of course, his death on the cross and the shedding of his precious blood, a big part of the earlier part of 2 Peter. Well, he's shown us some important truths about the day of the Lord. And now he's telling us that, listen, knowing these truths about the day of the Lord are intended to have an effect in the way you live. These truths are not shared by God with you and I so that we can just have some head knowledge, so we can answer correctly on the doctrine test. No, no, God's not interested in merely that, although it's important that we have that head knowledge. God means us to understand what he has said about the end times, but we need more than head knowledge about it. He says, this knowledge, this insight of the future, which I am lovingly and graciously giving to you, is meant to lead you to certain behaviors. It's meant to answer this question, what sort of people ought we to be? <laughs> Isn't that, see, that's how the ESV puts it, what sort of people ought we to be in light of these things? 
And by the way, the scripture is the only place we get a balanced answer to the question. When people think about end times, when they think about the, you know, the possibilities of judgment and all of that, the, the idea of Christ's return, they can come up with a lot of ideas of what they ought to do. The Bible is the only place we can turn to get good ideas about what we're supposed to do. Balanced ideas. Hey, listen, God is telling us a number of things here we're supposed to be doing, but before we turn to them, let me say this. There have been ideas proposed that are the wrong response. So when somebody says, well, how ought I to live? This is what you're not supposed to do. Number one, don't get preoccupied with the analysis of the times. God has already told us everything we need to know about it. Some people, in beginning to hear some of the things and learn some of the things God has said about the end times, spend all of their life combing the newspapers and looking at current events and trying to piece together all of the things. Hey, listen, <laughs> we don't need to spend our time in an analysis of all of that. Just know what God has said and then build on it. Secondly, some people, in knowing the inevitability and unalterability of Christ's return, have decided, well, the only appropriate thing for us to do then is let's sell all we've got and wait on the mountainside for him to come. Now, that's not the right response either. But we've seen both responses, preoccupation with analysis of the times and this and despairing, lethargic, selling what we have and just waiting on the mountainside for it to happen. Those have had far too many expressions in the Christian world. No, no, God says, that's not what I want you to do. Well, if that's not what you want us to do, God, what do you want us to do? And he says, here's what you do. You commit yourself to live lives of holiness and godliness. That's what you begin to do. The facts about his return, the facts about the culmination of history, the facts of the last days, the day of the Lord, are intended to motivate spirituality. Not speculation, not insecurity, spirituality. He says, listen, as you learn these things about me, I want you to focus on growth more than an analysis of current events. To my word related to the day of the Lord is meant to stimulate your discipleship. You catch it? The word ought here, Greek word die, means obligation, duty. <laughs> what, what should we of necessity do in light of these things? That's the better way to translate it, I think, to get to the actual idea here. You know, here's the day of the Lord. Here are these things that are going to happen. So what necessarily should we be doing in light of that is kind of the picture. And God says, hey, grow in your discipleship. Don't be complacent. Don't be speculative. Be surrendered and be growing. The word holy translates hegios, which means to live a separated, set-apart life. This is the time, understanding what God says about the end times, reinforces for us that we're to live in pure ways. We are to live counterculturally. Our lifestyle should be reflecting the kingdom's values, not the world's values, this world passes away. It doesn't know the truth. God gives us the truth, and he says, I've known you as my child because you've responded to the gospel. The kingdom is now yours. Live in light of it. Be a holy person. To the degree that I'm grasping what he says about the end times, to that degree, I'm growing in holiness if I'm not growing in holiness, I don't care what answers I give and how accurate they are about the end times. It's not having the effect God wants it to have in my life. So are you holy today? Are you growing and pushing forward in lives of holiness? He also says, I want you to do this in lives of godliness. Eusebia, piety toward God. Lives that are lived with a God awareness. You sense his presence. You seek out his presence. You reflect on him and interact with him prayerfully. It, it, it's a life, to have a godly life is a life that's lived with a clear sense of ultimate answerability before God. 
I, in knowing Christ as Savior, have passed out of judgment into life in the sense that I'm no longer accountable for my sins because Christ has taken them on the cross. But I am accountable, answerable to God for how I live my life. I still face God on that issue. And he's going to say, have you been a good steward? Are you growing? Have you been fruitful? Or are you coming just as through fire with nothing to show? To be a godly person is to be a person who lives with a sense of answerability and accountability before God. A life lived with God awareness and God focus. So how's it coming in your lives? Are you using the teachings of the scriptures about the end times and about the day of the Lord in the proper way? Well, join me tomorrow as we continue to study more about how shall we then live. God bless.